Hi, this is your host Sapna Bhartia and we are here at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon in Salt Lake City, in Utah. And today we have with us once again, Billy Thompson, Global DevOps and Platform Engineering Office of the CTO at Akamai. Billy, it's great to have you back on the show. You know, I'm having an awesome time, but it's even better now that I'm back on your show. So thanks for having me. No, it's my pleasure to talk to you and this is your place, right? This is where you belong in a way or the other. First of all, what kind of traffic you're seeing at the booth? What kind of conversation you're having with folks? And what kind of concern you hear from them where you see that, hey, this is where Akamai plays a great role? I'll start with the trends. So one that I guess I'm a little bit more into this time around is WASM. Now, that one didn't really sit home with me at some of the past shows, and that's kind of a fault of mine because when I was learning Rust, I, I just have a pairing in my brain with WASM as the next step for web applications and compiling to WASM. But then I also kind of have a lower tolerance for hype, so I just sort of looked over it. But this time around, I can't really articulate why, but it's just kind of having a different feeling in the conversations and they're happening in the booth. I saw a really cool talk, a lightning talk, not yesterday, but the day before on the WASM Edge. And I don't even remember the second half of it because I pulled out my phone and started looking at the GitHub repo. And I'm like, all right, this is pretty cool. So that those conversations have been trailing over at the booth as well. And then Platform engineering, you know, now that the hype around that has settled down, there's a lot more serious conversation about that. So, yeah, this that's what I've been picking up on so far, and yeah, I'm liking it. And one of the biggest uh, stories, at least from the Akamai lens, is the announcement of Akamai Ad Platform. Um, I would also like to talk about the whole Akamai and the cloud native ecosystem, but let's just quickly get the elephant out of the room, which is what is Akamai app platform all about? It's an IDP, and for the purposes of accessibility for our listeners, that's internal development platform. It's an IDP in a box. It just works. So the years sometimes that platform teams will spend stitching together all the pieces to fit in a Kubernetes cluster, to finally have something working, and then say, you have everything working, and then you add a network policy, and then it's broken again. So all this time and energy that they put into, and then it's different in every single organization. So we just have an opinionated stack that we did the heavy lifting of making sure it just works. All the knobs, buttons, and switches have at it, it works. And since now your role has changed, now you are, you know, part of, you know, office of CTO and focusing on DevOps and platform. So talk a bit about what kind of pain points, challenges, platform engineers, DevOps were facing that this Akamai ad platform will address. So the pain points are going to be the complexity, the non-standardization, and basically, not that I'd say the learning curve, but the using curve, right? Because I think that Kubernetes, at least in my opinion, I feel like is not that bad to learn. And I know some people get really hot when I say that, They're like, what are you talking about? Have you never used it? Like, you know, I, I understand the headaches that it causes. I, I've been there. But it's what you deploy on it when you go to set up your observability stack. And when you're doing backups, when you're migrating, and when it comes to building an internal developer platform and you want one opinionated set of tooling, back to my previous point, some teams can spend the better part of a decade just trying to get that right. You look at the CNCF landscape, there's a lot of tooling. I haven't used all of it. I don't know anyone that has, but all of these projects, some are better than others. I would say all of them are good if they're in the CNCF, but all of them have their pitfalls, every one of them. And then there's a matter of opinion about which ones are better than others. And 
you're kind of reinventing the wheel every time. And if the idea of platform engineering is to overall, one, save on costs, and two, deliver a better product, because let's take a step backwards. Like, think about the sort of messy dependency chain, or it's not always messy, but it can be, where developers build the product to make the end users happy. They give feedback when they're not happy, so the development teams need to iterate on that quickly and make them happy. But then they have their own toil internally, that whole thing called silos and culture problems and all that. So then the platform teams have to be like, okay, we have to fix this. So they have to develop a product that the internal teams can use to make the developers happy and the product managers and the SREs happy so that then they can develop the product that makes the end users happy. So this is a long dependency chain here. And then now if they're having the toil and they're suffering to get that part of it right, where's the benefit? So I've mentioned in the past that I think that cloud providers should just take on this task and be like, okay, we're gonna bang our heads against the ball and we're gonna get this right. We're gonna give you a stack that we can validate just works. We're gonna test all the Helm charts. We're gonna test everything. You can customize it from there and do whatever you do, but what we provided just works. And the whole concept of, is it usable? Can you use it? Is it actually reusable? Is it portable? If every company is doing their own thing. And that's not to say that people still don't want to do their own thing. And I don't necessarily discourage that but from my perspective, what I think that Kubernetes did, although there is complexity with it, it took what we were doing with DevOps, with containers, with the 12-factor app principles and the orchestration aspect to it, it made that easier. And yes, Kubernetes has complexity, but when I'm talking about easier, I'm looking at it from the perspective of I feed it some YAML, I told it what I wanted it to do, and it does, for the most part, the heavy lifting and spits out the results that I want. Now, let's look at products like Backstage. Kind of followed a similar model here, right? You have, a, you have one unified platform for it and then people can add to it, it can extend, you add plugins and other things. They just made that easier and look at how much that's taking off, right? So. From a cloud provider's perspective, if we are a good cloud for DevOps engineers and platform engineers, which I believe we are because we're just easier to use, we stick to the core cloud infrastructure primitives, big proponents of open source, and that's the type of solutioning and the type of workloads that do very well with us, then it just makes sense that our next step is to make that easier for them. So if we can package it and just hand it off and it just works. So basically, in addition to all the other pain points, it also makes Kubernetes kind of easier, right? For, I mean, complexity is there, so it lowers the barrier of entry, mitigate the whole learning curve as well. So more folks can get on board as quickly as possible. Yeah, so in this case, since it's deploying the Kubernetes cluster, and installing a bunch of these with Helm charts and you go to add your network and security policies and it doesn't break anything. From a learning curve perspective, you can just look at how we did it. All of this is open source. So, and I'm one of those people, one of the rare breeds that I just love to do things the hard way. That's just how I like to learn. That's how I like to R&D. Do I do that in production? No, no. Do I encourage my clients do that in production? No. But from my own learning, yeah, I'll bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster, self-hosted. I'll go through all the pain, just that's my adventure. But that's a learning curve that I embrace and a lot of people are not in a position where they can embrace that. Maybe they don't work for a cloud provider and they don't have the resources to just test that out. Of course, there is Minikube and other things locally, but we're talking about production and where time is money. So 
if you need to be an administrator of Kubernetes, or if you need to be a platform team developing an IDP, here's just an example that you can look at of how it works. It's like reading through documentation or a giant tutorial, step-by-step, -step, guide you from point A to point B. So in that regard, I would say it lowers the barrier to entry and lowers the learning curve. I mean, Linode was the one that kind of democratized the whole cloud. I mean, before AWS, you know, we, we were, I mean, I was a Linode user from the very early on. So you folks have been around for a bit, folks know. But Akama is a little bit newcomer in, the, in the, this cloud native ecosystem, though. Akamai has been a pioneer in this whole CDN and the security space. So can you also talk about what role do you see Akamai is already with the app platform playing and going to play in this ecosystem? Akamai is learning from Linode, which I think is really good because what Linode did was spend years not just sponsoring shows and putting their logo in places. Linode didn't just sponsor PearlCon. Linode was a part of PearlCon. You're a developer, I'm a developer, let's build stuff together, right? You know, the people at the show were not dollar signs walking around. They were our friends, they were our comrades, you know? And so building that up for so many years, and that's why Linode impressively was able to grow to 150 million in revenue a year business just word of mouth or people finding the sign up button it wasn't until a couple of years before the acquisition that we you know really started to roll out sales and marketing teams so there was just so much there just with the story of Linode and its contribution to open source and our CEO made commits to the kernel, right? And wrote his own modules, wrote it himself. That is just such a beautiful story to tell. And it's just something that you really don't see a lot anymore. Now, Akamai comes from an era 25 years ago where the internet was just atrocious, right? AOL dial up and they solved the problem of how slow everything is or what they call the worldwide wait and they developed the CDM. But only big enterprises could do something with it back then and you know, just the developer space back then, just the historic, very corporate, very sales led growth. It's, it was just a different environment, right? Now, to the developer scene that we have today, Everything's about product. Everything is product-led growth. And everything's about what can I get my hands on today? How can I interact with it? Where can I get help from my peers and other people that use this? So what I'm seeing is something as big as Akamai growing in that direction. And I think that is super, super critical right now. I know a lot of the talks and stuff have been happening around here, the hot takes around what's happening to open source and all the fear and uncertainty around license changes and you know the business source license. And a lot of what's happening though is a lot of big companies similar to Akamai that just take and take and take and take and take and take. Everyone's using open source. The fact is, is it can't just disappear because everything will crumble down, like everyone's using it. So there really needs to be more companies like Akamai giving back to it. And even me on an individual level, I haven't always given back as much as I've taken. In fact, my entire 2025 plan is around how much can I give back because I haven't even personally done that. When I write tooling for my team, it's very easy for me to go and just write something custom that just fits our use case for what we're doing and nobody ever sees that. It never sees the light of day. So even me personally now, I catch myself doing that and go, wait a minute, 
how can I generalize this and actually make this so someone else with a similar use case can use this exact same tool that I'm writing. So it's now just like this part of anything that I write, how can I open source it? Like it's an obligation, it's a duty, it's I've taken and taken and taken for a long time, so I need to give and give and give and give. And so I just see Akamai in its earlier stages of doing that at a much greater scale. Can you talk about what kind of culture Akamai is building internally so that more developers within Akamai are not only exposed to open source, but they also start getting involved, engaged with open source? The short answer is that we're having discussions about an open source office program and what that means exactly, because what happens a lot, and I, I, I wouldn't be able to say how much this is happening in Akamai just by lack of visibility. But one thing that is common is that there are a lot of companies that have employees who are making contributions to open source projects and they don't know about it. And some of that may be because it's just not whatever they're using at work. And some of it's because some of these companies have, do have strict policies that say, if you did this on our hardware, then we have ownership over it. And there may be other reasons as well. So a lot of times there could be several people within Occupy that have made several contributions that I don't even know about. But that's something I would like to know about because that's something we need to come together on. And we're having those kind of discussions as we speak. Billy, once again, thank you so much for taking time out today and uh, talk about, of course, the Akamai ad platform, but much bigger picture, how Akamai is you know, emerging as a very you know, critical player uh, in this uh, ecosystem. So thanks for those good insp insights. And as usual, I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for having a discussion about open source with me.